with all of this activity to replicate viral particles inside the host cell. I'm sure you can imagine that there are lots of effects that the host cell would feel. The host cell would definitely not be healthy after all of these mechanisms. And in fact, we, we can see the effects under light microscopes. These are what are referred to as cytopathic effects or CPEs, which is unique cell deterioration or disease that's caused as a result of viral infections of the host cell. Because they are unique and can be viewed in a light microscope, they can be helpful in identification and diagnostics of viral infections in hospitals. So even though the virus itself can't be seen, their effects on the host cell can. There are many different types of CPEs that we can see in host cells. In particular, some examples include rounding of the cells, cell shrinkage, detachment of cells from tissue, and cells fused together into giant multinucleated cells referred to as syncytia. These giant multinucleated cells are thought to be how viruses can spread from cell to cell more easily. An example of one of these giant multinucleated cells can be seen here as a consequence of the measles virus infection. Smaller cells with single nuclei surround it. Similar CPEs can be used to diagnose other diseases such as rabies. Rabies, instead of forming syncytia, can instead form cells that contain inclusion bodies or clumps of viral particles inside the host cell that's visible in the light microscope. These are referred to as negri bodies and are unique characteristics found in host cells that are infected by the rabies virus. Other means of diagnosing viral infections include direct fluorescent antibody tests, looking for antibodies in harvested host tissue or blood cells on a microscope slide. We can also cultivate viral particles in a lab. Cultivation of viral particles in the lab is generally not used for hospital diagnostics. Instead, they're used for research purposes or formation of vaccines. One of the more common mechanisms of cultivating viruses in the lab is using fertile chicken eggs. When you buy chicken eggs in the grocery store, they have not been fertilized. They are just eggs and no sperm has been allowed to enter. However, fertilized chicken eggs where they contain an embryo inside can be used to form vaccines and grow viral particles. In fact, the influenza vaccine every year is manufactured this way. Chicken eggs or duck eggs are particularly useful because they are already sterile environments that are self-sustaining. Researchers puncture a tiny hole in the shell of the egg and in a sterile environment, inject viral particles into unique regions of the embryo inside the egg. The virus is allowed to replicate, and in the case of forming vaccines, the virus is harvested from the egg. This is why if you've ever gotten a vaccine, you may occasionally be asked if you're allergic to eggs because even though they harvest and isolate the viral particles, they cannot guarantee that no egg protein comes with it. Another alternative for cultivating viruses in the lab 
is using cell cultures. In the past, whole animals, laboratory animals, were used for cultivation of viruses. However, for ethical reasons and cost reasons, this is not advantageous. Thankfully, scientists have discovered an alternative means whereby we can grow viruses in cell culture. Cells of various tissue and species types can sometimes be grown in liquid culture, either in a test tube or a tissue culture flask. And in an otherwise sterile environment where the only cells growing are these pure tissue cultures, viral particles can be injected and allowed to grow inside these cell cultures. This mechanism is primarily used in research labs. Again, viruses are generally not cultured in hospitals, primarily because of cost, limited laboratory facilities, and also that these cell cultures growing viral particles just take too long to diagnose viral infections. So how are viral infections diagnosed? One of the primary means whereby viral infections are diagnosed is rapid tests that look for the presence of antibodies or antigens in a sample. Antibodies are proteins that the body makes in response to an infection. These proteins are specific and are used for host defense. So if antibodies for a viral infection are identified in a sample, you know that that person currently has that viral infection or had the viral infection at some point in the past. On the other hand, other rapid tests can look for antigens. Antigens come from the pathogen and can indicate only a current infection with the virus. Other means of diagnosing viral infections can be used, such as ELISA, which also detects viral antigens or antibodies in a very quick way, or a PCR-based method. PCR is specific to the DNA or RNA of a viral particle. It does not look for the proteins from the viral particle like ELISA does. The PCR-based method is also quick and can be done in a few hours. As you can see, depending on the type of virus suspected, different tests can be used. While most viruses are considered disease-causing and many can be deadly, we have to remember that there are some advantages and benefits of viruses as well. One of these currently being investigated is phage therapy. Remember, bacteriophage are viral particles that can only infect bacterial cells. They cannot infect human cells. In the early 1900s, bacteriophage were being investigated as possibilities for killing off bacterial infections in the human body. A person infected with bacteria could swallow bacteriophage and get the bacteriophage to destroy the deadly bacteria. This was showing promise for some time until antibiotics were discovered and used in the Western world including Western Europe and the United States far more extensively. However, in Eastern Europe, specifically the Republic of Georgia, bacteriophage therapy continued. Today, with the increased danger of antibiotic resistance seen in many bacterial species, bacteriophage therapy is again gaining traction. And while no FDA clinical trial has been approved using phage therapy in humans. 
some preliminary clinical trials testing bacteriophage on humans does seem to work. This is especially true of MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, an antibiotic resistant strain of bacteria. Other viruses have been investigated for possibilities of destroying cancer cells. These types of viruses can be used in gene therapy to be injected directly into people in what's referred to as in vivo gene therapy or injected into petri dishes with harvested tissue or cells from the human body in what's referred to as ex vivo gene therapy. The engineered cells can then be injected back into the human and take root there. Gene therapy using these various viruses has been successful in treating some diseases in a limited way. Some of these diseases include cancer. Cancer treatment today primarily focuses on radiation or chemotherapy, both of which have extremely negative consequences in the short and long term. However, there are some viruses that have been shown to specifically seek out and destroy cancer cells. These oncolytic viruses do seem to be very successful and have been used substantially, especially through Stanford University, to kill off different cancer types. Finally, there's our last topic for the chapter that does not cover viruses, and that's the prions. Prions are importantly not viruses. They are single protein molecules and they do not contain any DNA or RNA. Prion stands for proteinaceous infectious particle and cause different diseases that are all fairly related, including bovine spongiform encephalopathy or BSE, otherwise known as mad cow disease, and variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or VCJD the hereditary form of which is just known as CJD or creutzfeldt jakob disease. These diseases can also be seen in sheep as called scrapie and in deer called chronic wasting disease. All of these organisms have prions in their natural form which help the brain function. But when these proteins in the brain become misfolded and abnormal, they become pathogenic and can resist inactivation by freezing, drying, heating, and chemicals. The way these infectious misfolded versions of the prions work is they make contact with the normal versions of the prion and cause a shape change, eventually leading to loss of motor coordination in the brain, dementia, neurological symptoms, and death. Autopsies reveal that these infectious prions can lead to holes in the brain and cell death in the brain. There is no treatment or cure available. These prion diseases, again, do not have DNA or RNA, but instead are able to replicate with just one protein particle, making them substantially different from the virus particles that we've talked about in this chapter. Well, that's it. I hope you learned about viruses and have your interest peaked to learn a little bit more as we proceed for the rest of the semester.